Um, yeah, so hi, hi everyone, I'm back. Uh, thank you to uh, Bob for taking over and uh, hope, hopefully, uh, you know, that gave some good background. I actually realized watching Bob's presentation yesterday uh, that there's a bit of overlap with this one. Um, there wasn't a bit of overlap with this one last year, so but it's a little bit too late for me to change my slides. So I'll just uh, go a little bit uh, more quickly over the stuff that Bob covered yesterday. So, um, so this time I'm going to be talking about document level models. And when I say document level models, I mean models that handle things that are much longer than what we've been handling so far. Um, not able to see something I write on the board since the camera is off. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, let me turn my camera on. That was not intended. Okay, yeah, there, there are my cameras up. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, document level models. And by document level models, I mean models that take in uh, not just individual sentences, but whole documents. And um, these are increasingly important as the tasks that we are handling are becoming more difficult and requiring, you know, more context to be able to answer them correctly. And so just to cover some of the tasks, uh, NLP tasks that we've handled so far, we've handled uh, things like language modeling. And language modeling, you know, is predicting the probability of a text uh, or predicting the probability of a next word in a text. Um, another one was uh, syntactic parsing, like what Bob uh, talked about before. And basically that's trying to un uh, uncover the underlying structure of a text, uh, usually on a sentence by sentence level. Another one we covered was a uh, classification of some variety. Here I'm showing it as a tree purely because it's uh, from the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank. But um, you know, basically it's taking in a text and outputting a label of some kind. And again, normally we covered this on the, uh, on the sentence by sentence level or at most on the paragraph level. And also tagging uh, where we did this uh, entity tagging. So, Interestingly, all of these tasks, basically, if we look at what we're doing, we're predicting the naturalness of a text. We are uncovering hidden structure in a text, or we're doing some sort of classification, taking in the text out, putting a label, or tagging uh, some part of the text or understanding the entities or other things that are included in it. And these can be connected to some tasks that we do over documents, uh, like what uh, Bob talked about in the discourse section last time. And uh, the first thing that we can do is document level language modeling. And this is predicting language on a multi-sentence level over a long coherent discourse, as opposed to only doing it on a, a sentence by sentence level. In fact, I would argue that mo like the mainstream in language modeling has now shift to, shifted to document level. We no longer really do a sentence by sentence level, but nonetheless, it introduces some uh, complexity into how we handle uh, long contexts. Um, another thing is document classification, uh, predicting the traits of entire documents compared to sentence classification. Um, in some cases, this can be easier than sentence classification. Like, in fact, uh, if we're talking about sentiment analysis, it's much easier to do it over a long, like, paragraph than it is to do it over a short, like, tweet, for example. Um, because if you have a tweet, you know, there might be a lot of contextual information that you're missing. Um, then another thing uh, I'm going to talk about is entity co-reference. So which entities correspond to each other? And this is in contrast to uh, something like NER, where we normally do NER, you know, over, uh, NER is normally less context sensitive than, uh, than something like co-reference. And finally, discourse parsing, which, you know, Bob also talked about on Tuesday, uh, but this is in contrast to sentence, syntactic parsing, where syntactic parsing, we're talking about like the relationships between words or the structure of a sentence, whereas discourse parsing, we're talking about, um, the structure of a document or the relationship between sentences. And uh, the top part could be characterized as prediction using documents, and the bottom part could be prediction of uh, document structure in some way. 
So first I'm going to be talking about document level language modeling, or maybe uh, more accurately, just language modeling over long sequences. And um, we want to predict uh, the probability of words in an entire document. And obviously sentences in a document don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, you know, like each sentence precedes the previous one. And also there's some sort of coherence, topical coherence, or uh, kind of stylistic coherence across sentences in a document. And we'd like to take advantage of the fact to do a good job in modeling. And um, so if you remember modeling using recurrent neural networks or kind of autoregressive models in general, uh, basically the models would pass information from document to document, uh, or sorry, from, from token to token. And specifically with respect to RNNs, they would do this using a hidden state. Um, despite the fact that we don't use RNNs anymore, I think it's important to think about this because it's a very clean way to pass information, even over long uh, sequences. So a very simple way to create a, you know, document level language model or a language model over the longest uh, possible text is just to infinitely pass the state in a recurrent neural network. So you have... Um, you have a recurrent neural network over one sentence, and then you have a recurrent neural network over the next sentence, and you simply pass the final hidden state from the previous sentence uh, to start predicting the next sentence. And now immediately you have kind of an infinitely long, uh, long distance language model. And you can also do the same thing for any sort of sequence model, right? Like, so we talked about RNNs as a sequence model. We talked about transformers as a sequence model. And basically what we're doing is we're just saying our sequence is not a sentence. Our sequence is a document. Our sequence is a very long, uh, like, sequence of text textual tokens. Um, so there's a couple problems with this. Uh, does anyone have uh, ideas of what might be an issue of just treating like one long, uh, treating an input as one long sequence? Vanishing uh, radius. Sorry, in the back first, yeah. Vanishing uh, radius. I mean, you won't be able to retain a lot of context because of the Yeah, vanishing gradients is is one thing. Um, Vanishing gradients is a good way to put it, specifically from the point of view of RNNs. Um, another way to put it is lack of ability to encourage the model to focus on the right, on the correct context. So vanishing gradients will prevent you from taking advantage of context that would have been useful in the past. But yeah, uh, I was okay. about to say, okay, the same thing. Um, so another, uh, another issue, uh, pointed out on Zoom is all information will be compressed into the last step hidden state. Um, yes, that is an issue. Um, more concretely, I guess it, it'd be a good, like what, what would be the issue that might result from that? So that's, that's a limitation, but like what, what sorts of mistakes might happen because you're compressing all of the information into this hidden state here? Any ideas? Memory might miss the nested information or long term dependency. Yeah. Um, and specifically with respect to RNNs, what makes that difficult is you won't even necessarily know if the information is going to be useful or not in the future. So if you have a limitation, if you have a bottleneck of how much information you can keep around, it might or might not be useful. And another analogy for this is like when you're taking a test and the test is on a whole textbook, you're gonna be much less effective than if like, it, it's essentially a closed book test. It's like, you need to remember everything and you don't know what's gonna, uh, what's going to be asked of you later. Whereas in an open book test, you can look at what is asked of you and then go back and reference the appropriate places in the original textbook. And so essentially RNNs are kind of doing closed book uh, are doing something in a closed book fashion and attention is doing something in an open book fashion where you can go back and take a look at it. Um, so another, uh, there's another really big problem, uh, obvious problem that nobody's mentioned yet. Any Anyone want to take another stab at another problem here? 
let, let me uh, just give an example. Let's say you want to uh, answer questions about a novel and the novel is a hundred pages long. Yeah. So you don't retain all the information at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So like it's in this case, it's similar where in a fixed length vector might not contain all of the information at the end and hence the attention aspect of like referring to previous um like uh, I think inputs or outputs that you generate during that question. Yeah, so um, I I agree that's a problem. That's pretty similar to the one that we we just talked about having a fixed length vector. So um, any other uh, any other issues? Maybe not necessarily uh, just about the accuracy of the model. Take a long time to pass it on the page then. Yeah, it would take a long time. Um, and another person on Zoom also said computationally expensive. So, you know, you're processing 100, 100 pages of text. Um, maybe if you're doing it with a shallow RNN uh, nowadays, you might be able to do it. But um, if you're doing it with a big transformer model, that's not going to fit. In, you know, even if it's computationally feasible, it's not going to fit in your GPU memory or uh, or something like that. So that's another uh, very big issue. In fact, the memory issue is probably bigger than the computational issue at this point. So um, there's a couple, uh, all of these are good points. Um, so the um, there's a number of ways, yeah. Coming back to the previous yeah. point, uh, so you were saying you don't fit in memory, but we usually share the parameters across time steps. Right? So will it be a problem we just going to use the same set of parameters for every time step? So will this be a problem if we're using the same set of parameters for every time step? So I, I think the memory, the problem is not the memory of the parameters so much as it's the problem of the, like calculating the hidden states. Oh. And um, at test time, actually, the, this is a interesting point. At test time, if you're using an RNN and not attention, actually that's not a problem because it's a recurrent function. So you can just throw away every token that you processed previously. However, at training time, you need to do back propagation. And in order to do back propagation, you need to uh, keep around the whole computation graph. Um, I, there are approximations to this, which I'm gonna be talking about in a second, but normally you need to keep around the whole uh, the computation graph and that becomes a problem. So basically to, to boil this down, there's two issues here. One is that modeling is harder because you're looking at a whole lot of context and you're not sure what's going to be useful in the previous context. Uh, you might have vanishing gradients and other things like that. The other problem is computational problems. So one thing that you can do to fix this is to have a separate encoding for coarse-grained document context and fine-grained uh, fine grained, like within sentence context. Um, there's a lot of um, examples of uh, how to do this. Um, sorry, this figure actually, um, this figure actually isn't the best uh, figure to demonstrate this. I think I might have like uh, accidentally removed the slide that's a better figure. But basically, um, what you normally do is you have encoding at multiple granularities. So you might encode. Um, a single sentence, uh, token by token, and then you pass up the encoding um, to a sentence by sentence encoder. Like this. So you have your token, you have your token by token encoding, but then you have a more coarse grained encoding that takes in like document by uh, sentence by sentence. And uh, so what this does basically is um, this makes it possible to kind of model both the fine grained dynamics of what you need to be modeling uh, to handle individual sentences and kind of the like larger scale discourse structure with another sequence model on top. Um, so which problem does this solve here? Any ideas? I talked about two problems. It can be one of one of the two or both. Long term dependency. 
the long-term dependency problem. Does it solve the computation problem? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, but maybe so. Uh, one way it could um, is if you are able to use fewer layers on this fine-grained level, um, like use uh, like just one one layer on the token by token level, and then have the remaining layers be on the um, on the more fine grained level. So then you would have to, uh, more coarse grained level. So then you would have to keep around fewer uh, fewer token or like fewer layers worth of information on the more coarse grained level. So it's mostly a modeling thing, but it could also help uh, computational feasibility too. So. I was talking about RNNs. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of slides on RNNs because we don't use them uh, very much anymore, but uh, some of the concepts are still useful when we talk about self-attention and transformers across sentences. And um, so the easiest way to apply a transformer across many sentences is you just self-attend to all the previous words in the document. Um, and so that is relatively simple and it can use document level context. Um, also, uh, by like that, you know, this paper by Voida et al. 2018 is one of the first papers that uh, that did this, and it also found that it could learn interesting phenomena, like it could learn to attend to the appropriate uh, antecedents uh, of particular words, and so it, it seems like it's learning something. Um, However, a really big issue with applying transformers is uh, computation and memory can become quadratic in uh, sentence length or in sequence length. And uh, if the sequence is, you know, a hundred pages of a novel, that's what, 10,000 uh, 10, words and 10,000 times uh, 10,000 is a hundred million. And that starts to be a lot of like computations when you're comparing large vectors together over many layers. So um, this becomes an issue. So there's a lot of ways to fix this. And I think most, uh, most models don't just uh, feed in very long sequences to transformers. Uh, rather, they use a, a variety of different methods to fix this problem. Uh, so one of the ones which I've talked about a little bit before is um, Transformer XL. And basically what Transformer XL does is it does a truncated backpropagation through time uh, plus uh, a transformer model. And so basically what it does is in the standard transformer, um, you would either attend sequence by sequence or you would attend to the, do self-attention to the whole sequence all at once. And what Transformer XL does is essentially it attends to fixed vectors from the previous sequence. So um, normal, normally what you do is you do the forward and backward pass over like your whole sequence. And um, so in order to do that, you need to keep around the whole computation graph, uh, the whole computation graph for the whole sequence. But what they do here is they do um, forward and backward. But what they do is they take all of the vectors that were calculated from the previous states here, and they treat them just as like a fixed input to the model, as opposed to um, as opposed to like doing backprop into the um, backprop into all of the vectors uh, or backprop all the way through the computation graph here. And so what this allows you to do is this allows you to pass along information from the previous uh, time steps, although not update the parameters of the previous time steps based on this. And we talked about this also a little bit when we talked about RNN models, which is the connection to RNN models here. And so one interesting thing, uh, kind of like quiz or thing to think about is how far back does that allow Transformer XL to, uh, to look? when it is calculating, um, or like how, how far back in the context does that allow this model to, uh, to look? If it's just one layer, like if it's just this, this first layer here, the answer is relatively, uh, relatively short, right? You would have four input 
tokens, maybe four word embeddings, and then you would have four extra word embeddings back here. But what about the second layer? How far, uh, how many word embeddings back does this layer have access to? Minus the context. Uh, because the previous layer would have looked uh, like the same context as before. So. Yeah. So, so basically now this layer here, um, so this layer had access to the current four and the previous four. This layer here had con uh, access to the current four and the previous four. So now this layer here has access to all, all of these 12 word embeddings basically. Um, and then you go to the next layer and this is able to attend to this and this. And this one had uh, access to 12 word embeddings. So uh, you can go back even farther. I feel like this becomes exponential, but I'm, I haven't thought about this uh, this carefully for a little bit. So this I think this actually stretches out to more than just like one more every time. It's I was wondering about that. Yeah, it becomes it becomes exponential, but I'm forgetting exactly how it becomes exponential. Let's see. Because I think the same layer, the the context would have still have the same length. So for example, in the first layer, it would have looked at previous four, and there'd be and all of the cells would look at both context lengths. The next layer, even the context would have yeah, yeah. Length. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah. So so basically it, here, this this one has looked, this one is able to look back to this. Which is able to look back further. So basically, it becomes it becomes sixteen, and then thirty two, and then sixty four. And so basically, like the amount of context that this model is able to uh, to access is exponential in uh, the number of layers. So that's a kind of neat trick, right? It's still a transformer model. You still could use it as is on like an equally linked sequence, but it allows you to uh, it allows you to also access. Uh, exponential length. What is the increased computational cost of training this model? Any ideas? Or like O O N, how much more? And just just to be clear. You're basically attending attending to this, but not you're not calculating this. You're attending to this, and you are calculating like all of the representations here. Any ideas? Okay. Um, I'll I'll give the answer. Uh, hopefully, uh, you had some time to think about it. But basically, it, it's more or less double. And the reason why is because um, we have the query vector and the key vector, uh, query matrix and the key matrix, and then we do the softmax, and then we multiply it by the value matrix. Right? That's our attention function. And basically, our key matrix is becoming twice the size. Uh, because now um, our key matrix and value matrix are both becoming twice the size because now um, these vectors here are appended onto the key matrix and the, the value matrix. So, so it's, not, um, it's not even quadratically larger. It's just like basically twice, twice as large. So... Um, Another uh, method that has been used in um, in training these models is uh, compressive transformers. Oh, great, great. Yeah. I just want to be annoying for a second. I mentioned this was invented at LCI. <laughs> Two of our people. Oh yeah, yeah, transformer. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Bob Bob has to uh, has to represent uh, CMU. So like two. Uh, PhD students. PhD students. Both both LTI, yeah. yeah. But two LTI PhD students made this, and it's uh, very, very popular. Um, okay, so the next thing is um, 
uh, compressive transformers. And basically what uh, compressive transformers do is they, um, they have a sh short, uh, the current sequence we're trying to model, uh, then they have the memory. So the memory is essentially like what we do for uh, transformer XL. We have uh, the previous couple uh, sequences and then they also have this uh, learned function that essentially compresses the memory into uh, something smaller, uh, with the idea being that it would be nice if you would be able to more directly attend to things that are even farther back. So Transformer XL basically only allows you to attend directly to the previous uh, like sequence or previous segment here. Whereas um, this year, according to this example, you have your sequence, you directly attend to the previous two sequences, and then you compress and indirectly attend to the previous, to the uh, like six ones before that. And so that basically increases the exponent on the Transformer XL model. Like here, the Transformer XL model doubles the length of context that you can look at at every layer. The compressive transformers like further increase the uh, the length of context that you can look at in every way. So another uh, method that people uh, have used pretty widely is sparse transformers. And sparse transformers, basically what they do is they, um, they're like what I talked about here for RNNs, uh, where you essentially downsample the size of things that you attend to at every layer. And however, the exact way they do it is not um, is not layer by layer. They rather um, allow each element in the each element that is doing attention to attend to, for example, all of the elements in the uh, in the current sequence, and then every, for example, every four elements in the previous uh, sequence, um, the previous sequences or something like that. So um, this is an example of autoregressive, like regular autoregressive transformers, like they're attending to all of the, um, all of the previous samples here. Um, and then you have like a strided sparse transformer and a fixed sparse transformer where you have like a four length four sequence and if you got rid of these like light blue things here, this would just be a regular transformer where you could attend to the previous four things in a, a length four sequence. And um, however, if you also add the light blue ones, now it's also able to attend to like every four uh, tokens previously. Um, I had a question, do the different shades of blue represent something different? So dark blue is the current token. Medium blue are tokens like within the current sequence. So they're like non-sparse attention to the more recent tokens. And then light blue is sparse attention to the like less, less recent tokens. And these, uh, this method was basically devised or this method was popularized by people at OpenAI. And so I think this is what is used in a lot of the like GPT models and other things like that. So it, it's how they can attend to very long sequences and still um, and still manage to fit things into memory with very large models. Another thing I should point out is that this is rather hard to implement if you don't have specialized GPU kernels, but there are specialized GPU kernels for sparse attention. So um, if you're planning to do something like that, I'd highly encourage you to use those because otherwise it's going to be, uh, there's not really a super easy way to implement it yourself uh, efficiently. Okay. Um, another thing is adaptive span transformers. Uh, this is kind of interesting from maybe a research perspective uh, more than uh, like, I, honestly, I think sparse transformers are a lot easier to implement, uh, but Adaptive uh, span transformers are kind of interesting because basically what they do is uh, they make the span um, or they make span adaptive attention head uh, or make the span adaptive attention head by attention head. Uh, so some are short and some are long. And so what they do here is 
they basically truncate the length of attention for different attention heads uh, based on the uh, based on how useful they are, based on how uh, like much adding additional context actually helps you uh, helps you perform the tasks that you're trying to perform. And this is empirically the values that they found to be uh, like the the spans that they found to be useful for each attention head. And one interesting thing they found is in the earlier layers, there was not enough gain by making the attention heads adaptive in order to like overcome this like prior that they had on like limiting the length of the attention. But as you got into later layers, some of the attention heads, but not all of the attention heads started to benefit by having longer context to the point where they essentially overcame this like threshold that you needed to have uh, in order to uh, have it attend to longer context. So what this is basically telling you is like at the very early layers, it's not necessary to have long context or it's not helpful to have long context. But as you get into the layer later layers, it does become helpful, which I, I guess isn't super surprising, but uh, it's nice to actually verify it empirically. Um, then this... Uh, can also further be combined with sparse computation. And uh, so there are sparse transformers, there are adaptive span transformers, and uh, they combine them together to make adaptive, uh, adaptively sparse transformers, which basically um, makes, uh, makes the computation sparse as well and further uh, theoretically could reduce the compute, but in practice, implementing these kinds of things on GPUs is also hard and can be a bottleneck. So um, then there's another paradigm of models. Uh, the, one example of this is reformer, and I want to like mention the reformer model, um, but there's also uh, a bunch of other ones that are kind of similar, like long former and, and things like this. But um, the basic idea is efficient uh, calculation of adaptively sparse attention. And there's kind of a chicken and egg problem in sparse attention, which is you can sparsify relatively low scoring values in order to improve efficiency, but you also need to calculate all of the values to know which ones are relatively low scoring, right? So um, the way that they implemented this and got this to work is um, they did efficient calculation of sparse attention by a uh, key. Um, basically, what they did was they made shared key and query parameters to put the key and the query in the same space. So normally, uh, when we calculate the key and value vector uh, matrices, um, we do like W, Q times the, the hidden states and W and K times the hidden states. And that gives us like the key and query vectors for uh, for attention. They uh, so what they did instead was they shared these parameters. They made the parameters the same. Um, then they used locality sensitive hashing to efficiently calculate the high scoring attention weights in sublinear time. Um, and. I covered, I think I wrote on the board uh, about locality sensitive hashing when we were talking about retrieval based models, but basically um, it's a kind of clever way so that you can find the nearest neighbors without, uh, without actually calculating um, all of the pairwise uh, comparisons. So by doing this, you can take attention and normally attention is um, T, Uh, normally calculating self-attention is T times T, where T is the number of query vectors and T is the number of key, uh, key vectors over here, uh, because doing the comparison between them requires comparing all of the query vectors to all of the key vectors. But now you're making essentially the query to key comparison less, um, like you're making the query to key comparison sublinear, so now it's like t times uh, a constant here. Uh, so basically, you can you can do this calculation in uh, linear time. So uh, 
after they did this, they did some additional things that are complicated, uh, but necessary to make this GPU friendly. So they basically did some chunking to make uh, sparse computation more GPU friendly. I wouldn't worry about this part. Um, if you want, if you're really interested, you can go in and read the paper. But I think the two more important things are the shared key and query parameters and the fact that they're doing like a sublinear time search over here. So my summary of this paper is it's kind of an amazing feat of engineering, and they actually demonstrate that it works pretty well at calculating sparse attention. Um, I like theoretically nice things. I like things that aren't very hacky. So the fact that you're able to calculate attention, um, you're able to calculate attention over all of the inputs without doing any sort of thing like, um, like a fixed length sparse attention or something like that is attractive. However, this would be horrible to implement. So I <laughs> like, unless you really, really uh, like pain, I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't go in and implement this yourself. I'd just use an out of the box already implemented package for something like this. So, um, uh, so yeah. Another uh, really interesting thing that's kind of interesting academically, but I don't know if I'd recommend that you actually use this, is uh, you can actually do low rank approximations to attention. And so calculating the attention matrix is expensive, but it might be able to be calculated in a more efficient way. And uh, so the what you can do is you can basically take advantage of the fact that The most expensive thing in calculating attention is kind of this uh, query times key. Uh, sorry, I guess it doesn't go that way, but like this this query times key uh, calculation here. And however, we know a lot about linear algebra, um, and we can use a lot of the things that we know about linear algebra to make this very large matrix multiplication more. Um, more effective without losing a whole lot of accuracy in the calculation. And there's a couple of methods that, that do this. Basically, uh, Linformer adds a low rank linear projection uh, into the model. Uh, so they, they project the query and key vectors down into a smaller uh, space to make this much more efficient. And uh, there's also the Nystrom former, which uh, basically uses uh, something called the Nystrom method, which calculates uh, sample some landmark points and allows you to make this calculation. Um, so I'm not going to go a lot into the details of each of these, but the basic idea is that you know you want this um, you want this matrix of scores between the two, and you can decompose them into something that you can calculate more efficiently using linear algebra uh, based methods. Okay. So this is kind of an overview, yeah. Uh, there is methods of uh, pass attention stored in the memory system because you still need the entire transformer on the GPU. Um, so for sparse attention, they won't entirely solve all of your memory issues, I, I guess, especially if it depends if the hidden state or the kind of um, attention matrices are the problem. And I, I think the hidden state, especially the feed forward layers can be uh, can be the problem in a lot of cases. So um, for memory, things like transformer XL will solve your memory problems, but uh, some of the other ones won't necessarily do that. Like compressive transformers, uh, if you're doing some sort of truncated backpropagation through time will, but if you're just feeding all of this into your computation graph, they, they won't. And in fact, this method might make it even worse with respect to memory if you're not truncating somewhere, yeah. Your, uh, compressed memory is not a fixed length um, memory length. This here, I, I think they truncated the length of the compressed memory too, yeah. 
So anyway, these are these are some methods uh, that you could be using. In terms of the simplest possible method that you could be using, it would be something like the sparse transformers here. I, I'd recommend this. If you're using this, there's also other um, other like nice implementations that are hard to implement, but somebody's already done that for you. So you can just use them like reformer or longformer, uh, which would also be other uh, good uh, ideas. So then another uh, another question is how to evaluate document level models. And um, the simplest thing is to do perplexity, um, which allows for classification over long documents. Um, uh, sorry, per doing perplexity or classification over long documents. Um, this is one way to do things. And in fact, I, I think if you can get obvious perplexity improvements, that's like for language modeling or something like that, then that's great. Uh, the problem is like, can anybody think of a problem of like using perplexity over long documents as a like measure of how much your contextual model is improving things? Like, let's say we're talking about language modeling, um, language modeling for novels or something like that. Um, so I see small probabilities will will lead to underflow or uh, or zero values. Um, Kind of, you, you can deal with that by doing log probabilities or standard perplexity things. So. Any other ideas? What exactly are we classifying? Um, let, let's talk just about perplexity for now. So like language modeling perplexity. Um, yeah. Very sparse and long and we need to do so. Across, calculate the entropy across entropy. There's a very sparse or long softmax that you need to do to calculate the entropy. Yeah, that is that is one issue. Um, like fitting things in memory is a problem, but that's not a problem only of evaluation. It's a problem of like modeling also. Um, I have another uh, another thing. The overall perplexity value may be dominated by the perplexity of short sentences. That's very close to what I was going to say. So, uh, like, good job. I'll, I'll say the thing that I was going to say anyway. Um, the basically the perplexity the the places where long context models are actually going to help your perplexity are relatively few uh, because short contexts are like the difficulties in modeling short context dominate the number of things that you need to be modeling so there are some places where long context allows you to resolve ambiguity like for example um, when modeling a novel, a character might appear in chapter two and then appear again in chapter seven. And you want to get that person's name right, right? Like if you mess up that person's name in chapter seven and come up with a completely different name, then that would be very strange from a human point of view. However, those phenomena are rare. Like they're gonna be one in a thousand tokens or one in 10,000 tokens. And because of that, like relative things that only require relatively short uh, sentences are going to dominate like your actual perplexity numbers. So it's not basically not sensitive enough um, to whether you're doing a good job of capturing context. And that's also the case for machine translation, for example. Um, there's a very limited number of phenomena where incorporating context into machine translation is useful. And those tend to be really important. They tend to be things like, domain specific technical terminology or other things like this. But unfortunately they don't show up in metrics like blue scores. So for a long time, people were saying incorporating context in machine translation isn't useful because our blue scores aren't going up. But that actually wasn't the case. It was just that the metrics were not good enough to detect that the translations were becoming better. So um, there's a number of more focused uh, methods. Uh, there was a sentence scrambling method, but that's like kind of uh, too easy nowadays. Um, another thing is people set up um, set up uh, kind of like challenging sets where you would have a long story and then you would have several 
potential final sentences about how that story would end. And you needed to pick the correct one based on the previous story. Um, another thing is like focused word uh, prediction tasks. So um, they would pick particular words that they thought it was important to have context for and evaluate the model's ability to dist distinguish specifically between those words. <laughs> Um, and there, you know, we know we need long context to be able to distinguish that. Um, there's also a composite benchmark containing uh, several tasks called Long Range Arena. And um, uh, this uh, Long Range Arena has become very popular in long sequence modeling. It's not just, uh, it's not just textual tasks. It's also uh, things like image modeling and, and things like that as well. Um, one thing I should mention that I... Uh, I haven't put in my slides is there's also been um, a recent move towards investigating models, um, investigating models that don't use transformers um, for long sequence modeling. Um, the most famous one uh, recently is this S4 model. Um, and this is a paper about it. Um, uh, it's efficiently modeling long, uh, long sequences with structured state spaces. Um, this paper is rather involved. It's a little bit tricky to, um, to parse everything that uh, is happening in this paper, but the, um, the most important point, sorry, let me, let me move this over uh, to my screen so I can find it again. The most important point of the model is that basically they're um, they're creating a model that is easily um, easily expressed by kind of these linear transformations, and um, because it's easily expressed by linear transformations, uh, one thing that you can do is. Say that um, the next the next state, like the state at x uh, t, is equal to um, a x t minus one. Um, but the state at x t is also equal to a squared x t minus two, or um, a cubed x t minus three, and because you can calculate, uh, because you can calculate this, essentially, um, what this means is that you no longer have to. Um, or actually, sorry, it's more, it's more like this. It's like a x t minus one plus a squared. Um, x t minus two plus a cubed x t minus three, like this dot dot dot, and so because you can calculate it like this, um, this is like very easy to par parallelize and calculate efficiently. So you don't need to. Um, it it's basically a lot more efficient than attention. So you can run it over very long sequences without kind of all of the tricks that you're doing. Uh, doing otherwise. Um, I'm simplifying things quite a bit. Like, as I said, the, there's a lot going on in this paper, but that's a basic idea. Um, and recently uh, we published a paper um, called uh, Moving Average Equipped to Gated Attention. And basically this, uh, or MEGA, and basically the way that this works is, it adds something like this, but makes it even simpler. It's basically uh, replacing this A with uh, a single scalar. And so you're just taking the like moving average uh, of the previous states. And then we combine this together with a chunkwise, essentially transformer model. Uh, so it's kind of like, 
it's a little bit like the sparse attention that we talked about before, except um, instead of doing sparse attention, kind of the sparse long distance things are all handled by this moving average. And then the kind of local things where we're combining together uh, vectors locally are done by attention. And then these are kind of interleaved in the uh, in the calculation of the long distance things. And on long range arena, like this model is, does very well. It's relatively simple, but it, it gives very good performance on a lot of the tasks. So um, yeah, that, that's mostly what I have about the modeling part of the uh, long, long distance things. Are there any questions here before I move on? Okay, um, so as I said, uh, a lot of the remaining content is kind of like similar to some of the stuff that Bob said before. So I'm gonna kind of jump, go over that quickly, um, but I'm gonna be talking about the modeling uh, that we do with neural models as well. So um, that, that part will be, uh, will be new. So um, one document level problem that we haven't handled yet. This is a problem that if you haven't built practical NLP systems, you might be like, uh, why, why is this important? Like, why do I need to worry about this? But in reality, in a lot of practical NLP systems, this is a huge problem uh, because like uh, pronouns or uh, basically pronouns are ubiquitous um, within uh, text and lo in long documents, it's very common to refer to something as like he or she or uh, it or something like that. And so if you say, um, oh, I really hated it. I don't want to go there again. What is it? That becomes very important if you're doing like target specific sentiment analysis or something. So um, entity co-reference, like as Bob mentioned before, it's basically finding which elements in a sequence or in a document refer to the same thing. And so if we have Queen Elizabeth and her are the same, uh, King Husband and King George VI are the same uh, and other, uh, other things like this. This happens in two uh, steps, identifying noun phrases, mentioning an entity, and clustering the noun phrases together. Uh, this is kind of important because you're going to need to either choose to do both of them together or do them in separate steps. Uh, this noun phrase identification and, and noun phrase clustering, mention clustering. So noun phrase detection, um, this is a difficult problem because um, you, if you're looking to do a uh, co-reference, you might get something like a renowned speech therapist was summoned to help the king overcome his speech impediment. And you want to know whether a renowned speech therapist is the entity you should be referring to or a renowned speech. And in this case, uh, there's no renowned speech uh, it's only the renowned speech therapist, but if you mistook these boundaries, then you would basically fail at co-reference resolution. Um, so uh, once you have appropriate noun phrases, you can think of co-reference as a, a clustering problem. Um, so uh, components of a co-reference model, um, like, like a traditional machine learning model, um, we need to know the instances that we're doing a classification over. Um, and we need to design features over the instances, and we need to optimize the model towards evaluation metrics. And uh, finally, we need a search algorithm for, uh, for the structure. So this is like many of the structured prediction uh, problems that we've talked about before. Um, in co-reference models, uh, the instances are, um, uh, so we need to define our instances and co-reference is basically a structured prediction problem. So um, the number of possible cluster structures is exponential in the number of mentions. It's basically a partitioning problem where we need to, um, we need to partition, uh, partition all of the mentions into uh, clusters uh, together. And models uh, are designed to approximate or explore the space. And the core difference between them is in the way each instance in, is constructed. And there's a bunch of different methods, mentioned-based or entity-based methods. Um, mentioned-based methods, basically what they do is they try to um, find out when two mentions correspond to each other. Entity-based methods, um, entity-based methods try to identify when um, 
like try to cluster mentions into entities and then uh, calculate the equivalence between entities. And so if we have uh, one document where we have like Hillary Clinton and Clinton and she, and we look at Bill Clinton, um, if we're doing a mention-based model, this actually might be rather difficult because like if we're trying to calculate the similarity between Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton and Clinton and Bill Clinton and she, Excuse me. Bill Clinton and Clinton actually seems like a pretty reasonable entity link, right, uh, mention link, right? So we can only kind of rule out the fact that Bill Clinton is matched with this Clinton if we know that all of these entities are in a cluster. So that's a kind of advantage of an entity-based model. However, uh, entity-based models are more complicated. So uh, mentioned pair models are models that are, are quite popular. And uh, the way it works is you set, classify whether two mentions uh, correspond to the same structure, which means like Queen Elizabeth and her should be, uh, you know, a positive example. Queen Elizabeth and husband would be a negative example, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a simple model, but it has uh, many drawbacks. It can result in conflicts in transitivity. So you might have like Queen Elizabeth and her are clustered together. Uh, Queen Elizabeth and a viable monarch in clus are clustered together, but a viable monarch and her are not clustered together. And then what do you do? Do you say they're all one entity or not? Um, another problem is there's too many negative training examples or training instances. So, you know, most mentions will not match with each other. So you get a very class imbalanced problem. Um, and as I mentioned before, it doesn't capture entity or cluster level features very easily. So entity mention models, entity mention models, what you do is you create an instance between a mention and a previous cluster. And what I mean by a previous cluster is usually these methods work by gradually building up, like gradually stepping through a document. And for every new mention, they decide whether to cluster it with one of the previous mentions. And then that becomes an entity cluster. And you use the features of that entity cluster uh, for the remainder of the classification. Um, this is a really big advantage of allowing you to come up with cluster level features. Um, so for example, are the genders of uh, the people all compatible? Um, is the cluster containing only pronouns, which indicates kind of like a bad cluster, right? Uh, cluster shouldn't contain only pronouns usually. Um, another thing is uh, would most of the entities be of the same gender or are the size of the clusters reasonable? Um, so, uh, this also has its own problems, like figuring out how to turn a cluster into cluster level features is difficult. This can even be difficult within neural models because it's like, how do you take a whole bunch of neural representations and turn them into a individual, uh, individual cluster. So basically they add a lot of, co uh, complexity computationally, but they have, uh, intuitive advantages. So uh, neural models are have kind of revolutionized co-reference. Like co-reference was one of the problems that really only became feasible after neural models uh, came into the picture. Um, they have advantages of being able to learn the features with embeddings since most can be captured by surface features. And um, another thing uh, that became widely popular is training towards metrics using reinforcement learning methods and jointly performing mention detection and clustering. And all of these have led to significant improvements. Um, this paper is a great paper. I think it won best paper at NACL 2017 or something like this. Um, it's a great paper, not just because its results were very good, but also because I think it's a template for other um, types of problems, uh, for how you can handle other types of problems. So I think like even if you're not interested in co-reference, it's worth seeing uh, what they did here. So there's two main contributions. Uh, one is how can we represent uh, features with a more typical neural network uh, based in, or how can we represent features with a typical uh, neural network based embedding? And also can a neural network um, allow errors to flow end to end, including both mention detection and co-reference? And so this is the model. 
it's a two-step model, but it's end-to-end -end differentiable or mostly end-to-end -end differentiable. And so the way it works is first they use an encoder. Uh, they, because it was 2017, they used a bidirectional LSTM, but that doesn't really matter. You could use a transformer or BERT or anything like that nowadays. Um, and then for each span, they get a representation of the span. Um, spans can be anywhere from like length one to length, you know, whatever, whatever limit you want to put on the length of uh, reasonable spans. And the way they got a representation of each span was they took the first embedding in the span, the last embedding in the span, and uh, the sum of all of the embeddings in the span. So by doing that, they now get a span representation that's like three times as large is the original underlying representation that you got from BERT or whatever other model you, you wanted. Um, from this span representation, they calculate a mention score for each span. So you get a mention score for every single one of these. Um, and then you take the mention score in some of these have very good mention scores, very high mention scores. Some of them have very low mention scores. And something that would have a high mention score is something that's very likely to be a noun phrase. So general electric would have a high score. Uh, electric said the would have a low score because it's very unlikely to be a mention. So then after this, uh, what they do is they calculate co-referent links and um, they calculate a score by taking in the mentioned scores. So like, for example, if they have general electric in the company, they would take the mentioned scores from each. And then they'd also calculate a score uh, by taking in the representations of each span and running them through a function and calculating the, uh, the co-reference score, and then also adding that together. Um, Based on this, they then uh, calculate a softmax essentially for each previous mention uh, given the current mention and, um, and try to maximize the probability of the, uh, of the correct links and minimize the probability of the incorrect links. So this is a mention pair model uh, where basically they, um, they calculate the, they try to upweight the correct mentions and downweight the incorrect mentions. And they also have a, um, a separate one here for like this is a new mention. This isn't. This doesn't match up with any of the other previous mentions that we've seen before. So there's a really neat trick here um, that allows you to backprop the loss from this final decision here into the mention detection model. Does anyone see where the trick is? So this is the stage two model. This was the stage one model. Where is the trick that's allowing them to optimize this end to end? Anyone see? So vector from the span representation makes the pads. Uh, I mean, they will take the span representation of a pad to come up with an embedding and put it into the core reference score model. Either. Yeah. That's creating the connection between the two. So basically the white the white yeah. scores here. Yeah. <clears throat> that that's actually not it. It's the other it's the other one, but you're pretty close. So in the note that the mention detection model was um was calculating these black scores. And because the mention detection model was calculating the black scores. The fact that you're adding the black scores into the score here is what allows you to backprop all the way back. So you could also think of a model that doesn't do that, right? You could think of a model that only takes in the scores of the spans, calculates this white score here, and uses that directly in the softmax. And that would be a perfectly good model, right? Like you're, you have mentions, like let's assume that you had a pipeline-based mention detection model where you do the mention detections and then you do the co-ref. Um, that would still be fine. That would still, you'd still probably be able to create a pretty good model, but it wouldn't be back profitable into the um, mention detection model. So they're only able to do that because they're using the non-pair features here. So I think this is a really neat trick 
you can also think of other ways that you could use this trick in a pipeline model. So does anyone have any other ideas of pipeline models that you might be using uh, for anything we've talked about in this class, maybe something you're doing in your project? Any ideas? What's a what's a pipeline pipeline model for NLP? Is anyone doing question answering for your project? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, what what kind of what kind of question answering? Multilingual question. Multilingual question answering. And uh, over what data source? Um, we have sport, but we also have, it's been augmented by using Google Translate into other languages. Okay. Other it's like Squad, but Google Translate into other languages. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I see, I see another. Can it be a reader retriever model? Instead? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> that's why I was trying to get at. So a reader retriever model. So a, a retriever, maybe a retriever reader model would be a better way to put it because you retrieve first and then you read. So a way you could do this without doing, oh, and I see on Zoom open domain QA. So yeah, that's another, uh, that's another way of saying it. So basically in these models, what you do is you retrieve uh, some evidence and then you use that evidence that you retrieved to help answer questions. Um, and you could do this in a pipeline thing. You just train a retriever and then you train a reader. Um, and then you take the output of the retriever and, and feed it into the reader. But another thing that you could do is you could take the scores that you got from the retriever. And let's say you have an attention-based model. You have an attention-based reader model that attends to like all of the passages that you retrieve and uh, generates the answer. And normally you just do attention. Maybe you do docu document level long sequence attention like I talked about earlier in this uh, earlier in this class. But another thing you could do is you could take the retriever score uh, for each passage and add it into the attention's logits. Um, and if you added the retriever score for each passage into the attention's logits, basically what you would be doing is you'd be encouraging this model to upweight uh, to upweight the attention for things that the retriever thought were good, downweight the attention for the things that the retriever thought were bad, and then you could backprop uh, backprop that into the retriever model itself. So basically, the the basic idea is. You have some sort of you have some sort of thing like upstream model that calculates a score, and then you somehow use that score in the downstream model, and that means you can backprop into the into the upstream model or into the first stage model. So, a very very nice uh, method here. Yeah. Uh, how do they calculate a span limit? Like, is it fixed in the first stage of the model? So in the first stage of the model, they limit the span length to like reasonable lengths. So I forget what it is, but I think it's seven or something like that. Yeah, I mean, but, but how do they like see that, okay, uh, general electric should be the first span, that should be of length two, and the next span should be of length three. How do, we, how do they calculate the each span's length? Exactly? Oh, so they just enumerate all of the spans up to length seven. Oh, oh what, and one other really important thing that I, I said, I forgot to say is um, if they, used every single span uh, when they enumerated all of them, uh, that would be too computationally expensive when they were doing the co-ref. So they actually prune out the low scoring spans. Um, they don't prune out all of the, they, they don't prune out all of the spans. So some of the spans that they don't prune out are still gonna be reasonably, are still gonna be bad ones, but that's okay as long as it's computationally tractable. Um, and because the mention, Detection model is trained jointly with the um, uh, with the other model uh, with the downstream co-ref model. The mentioned detection model will continue to get better at better better and better at identifying like correct spans essentially. So, uh, so they also prune out the uh, scores that are low. They prune out the spans with low scores. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, There, there's a few examples of using co-ref in neural models. Um, 
I, I just have a few examples here. There's like co-reference aware language modeling, uh, co-reference aware QA models. Um, I think these are interesting, but I, I've seen fewer of these. Uh, I've seen fewer of these things like using them directly in models um, because using them directly in models, I, like you're basically relying on your co-reference model to be as good or better than your neural model at resolving co-ref. And actually with unsupervised pre-training nowadays, you know, like pre-trained models are pretty good at doing co-ref, even if you don't explicitly train them to do so. Um, however, I, I think the bigger use of co-ref is that, um, for example, if you're doing target-aware sentiment modeling or something like that, you need to know, like, let's say you get a, a sentiment classification that this person really hates it. You know, it's like, I hated it. I don't, I never want to go there again. You want to know what that it is. You need to be able to resolve it back to an entity that you care about. And if that's the case, then you need co-ref. And question answering, uh, again, you know, uh, who, uh, uh, who had a very good game at the football game on, on Thursday? He did. That's not going to be very helpful, right? So you need to know who he refers to. So it's uh, it's a similar thing like that. Um, finally, I'm going to talk just a little bit about discourse parsing because Bob mostly talked about it uh, last time. But discourse parsing, uh, as Bob said, it's basically... Um, identifying the structure of a full document in the relations between uh, between each uh, like segment of the document. It's done on elementary discourse units, which are not full sentences, but they're kind of units of text that can be in relations with each other. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. Um, the most modern way of doing this is basically to calculate span representations for the spans you're interested in and do some sort of pairwise uh, calculation between them. Uh, this is usually done by, uh, you know, pulling the first and last uh, representations of like a, you know, a long document model and, uh, and calculating the relations between them. I'm not going to go into a, a lot of detail about this. Um, there's another interesting uh, method for using discourse structure in um, in neural models, which I, I like a lot. Um, and basically uh, what they did was they used discourse structure as a prior about what information they thought would be most important within a document in order to do uh, to do classification. And uh, the specific way they did this was um, by essentially coming up with a recursive model that um, uh, coming up with a recursive model that weighted the representations differently based on the discourse uh, discourse structure. And um, one interesting thing you can do this uh, you can do with this is like there's. Um, there's classification for like whether something is in a side or not. So if it's in a side, it's probably going to be less important. If it's uh, like core content, it's going to be more important. Um, and one interesting thing um, uh, that they showed in this uh, paper was essentially that uh, the accuracy of classification over uh, Yelp reviews actually improved as your discourse parsing accuracy got better. Uh, so this uh, kind of gave you some encouragement for uh, trying to uh, do this uh, sort of parsing. Um, my also kind of on a higher level, the, these uh, this work is a little bit older, um, and I, I probably should find an updated example. My impression about kind of incorporating the this long document information into like neural models is in like 2015 or 2016, I would have said it's a great idea to incorporate syntactic information into neural models because neural models were not capturing syntax super well and you were able to come up with better models that captured syntax. Um, nowadays, neural models capture syntax so well that it's, basically not very fruitful to 
use them in kind of naive, at least in naive ways to improve neural models. Um, there are certainly places where neural models don't do a perfect job at capturing long distance dependencies like CoRAF or entity linking or other things like this. Um, so I think if you're thinking about incorporating structure into neural, uh, like th these sorts of structures into neural models, it's not a bad idea. Like you can definitely think about doing something like this, but before you actually do do it, I would take a state of the art model and, and basically confirm to yourself that the problem you think might be a problem actually is a problem uh, because there are certain, uh, like certain models can be like much better than you expected. Like um, one thing that informed my thinking about this was I was playing around with a DBERTA based natural language inference model. And I tried to give it all sorts of very like weird syntactic structures, give it like double negations and stuff like this. And no matter how much I tried to abuse it, it like basically still worked. And I was like, okay, based on this, I, you know, maybe I shouldn't be working on handling negation and like natural language inference models. You know, it's probably not a good idea. However, then you you do a very simple like inference about the world. Like it's cold out. Um, it was cold outside, so he needed to wear a thick jacket or a, like a light jacket or something like this. And it it failed on, on like, I, don't, I forget exactly what I asked it, but it failed on very simple things like that. So sometimes like just taking a good model and playing around with it and trying to find out like where it fails can lead you to decide when this sort of structure is useful and when it's not. So uh, that's my, my final thing. Um, anything before we wrap up? I don't see anything, so uh, happy to answer any questions up front as well.